Welcome back to the SEO Weekly, where queries are weird, advice is controversial, and everything depends. I'm your host, Garrett Sussman of iPoll Rank, and each week I cover everything that's going on in the world of SEO. Blog articles, new tools, Twitter threads, conferences, you name it, we cover it every Monday. Subscribe if you're into it so you can kind of get your, your week started in the world of SEO. But this week we're talking about Another article saying, is Google search dying? How you should actually be looking at the SERPs manually to identify search intent in a variety of different strategies and SEO pricing and SEO salaries. Where are we with all that? Let's dive in. So first off, in the world of Google, uh, Search Off The Record podcast has another episode all about UX and SEO. This one included Gary Ilias, uh, Martin Split, and Lily Sassman, and they talked all about kind of the ambiguity of UX. It's interesting where Lily points out that in a lot of the developer documentation, there's no real reference to user experience and UX. And yet we're trying our best to produce this content that's good for the users. And so a lot of kind of insights were surfaced in this episode. It's funny, it's one of those things where, you know, Gary says something and SEOs jump, but some of the insights were on point. For instance, he acknowledged that when it comes to content that isn't visible, Google no longer demotes that in importance. Historically, at one point, basically Google said, oh, well, the visible content is going to be more important than kind of hidden content. He says, no, as long as it's in HTML or it's in like immediately accessible JavaScript, it has the kind of same value of importance. Brody Clark on Twitter pointed out that there were some updates to documentation around the crawl stats report. Specifically, he identified some changes to the way that Google handles robot.txt files. Specifically, uh, updates around you know this idea of what is considered successful and unsuccessful, and then basically at what point does uh, the Google crawler ignore whether or not there's a robot text file or not. So for instance, he said, if you go, if Google finds that there's like a 404 page for the robot file, that that's actually considered successful. And then Google will just consider that there are no directives to ignore pages on your website. He also points out that, you know, there's this time frame like 12 hours all the way to 30 days where Google will continue, the Google bot will continue to check to see if there's a successful robot text file. After 30 days, if there's not, they'll check the home page. If the home page is accessible, then they'll just crawl the entire site. If there's no home page, after a while, Google bot will actually stop crawling the site, although it always will kind of check in periodically. So that's an interesting update to documentation. Barry Schwartz found uh, that there was documentation updated that Google will actually look at the first 15 millibytes of HTML when it's crawling your site. So just uh, uh, another piece of advice to kind of keep your HTML of your site light so it actually all gets crawled by Googlebot. Otherwise, potentially stuff can be missed if it's too epically long. And remember, this is different than anything related to like images that's fetched separately than just the main HTML file. This is just talking about the main HTML when it comes to that initial 15 uh, megabytes. So SEO consultant Barry Adams, who's an extraordinaire when it comes to news SEO, he's been doing it for, for decades, knows all the ins and outs and, and has identified a range of different strategies and tactics that publishers frequently mess up when it comes to optimizing their news sites. So he dropped in a Twitter thread, really interesting highlights. For instance, your image aspect ratio of feature images. If that's messed up, then you're not gonna get served up in Google Discover or Google News. And he finds that a lot of publications do that. Internal linking, there are no standards across some organizations and it's down to the journalist to add a tag of you know a specific category in their article. And due to that, there's all these missed opportunities with internal linking if that's not done correctly. He's found that pagination of articles lists on category pages is handled with like a load more button or infinite scroll. And so Google 
doesn't crawl all the other links there. Another internal linking opportunity completely missed. EAT is messed up because there are no like author pages and bios uh, or info on editorial policies for smaller news publications. And that, you know, really hinders your authoritativeness when that isn't included on the website. Take the time to build out those author pages and put real valuable content on there. It'll help your rankings significantly. The constant need to balance monetization with user experience, like the load speed is a really tough challenge. So, you know, yes, you need to make money, but you shouldn't focus on the ad um, subscription revenue and those interstitial pops of, pop-ups and all that heavy loaded JavaScript at the expense of the user experience hurting your rankings and ultimately your organic traffic there. And then finally, many sites do a lot of the big things well, but they, they miss the details. You really can't forget about all those little details when it comes to internal linking and optimization and page speed. It all adds up in the long run great article. Uh, Barry actually has a newsletter. So follow, follow up on the newsletter and subscribe to that if you if news SEO is important for your job. So is the future of SEO searching on TikTok? Turner Novak shared this TikTok from Stazilicious. And uh, let's hear what she has to say. I want to buy a new face mist, a new face product. TikTok. Not sure how to cook something. TikTok. Like, why would I Google something? And I can go on TikTok, watch a 15 second video, it gives me the full lowdown on how to make something, if something's good, how to use something. I get like a little visual of it. And it's literally so easy. Please tell me I'm not the only one. I so there you go. Gen Z, whole generation that are using TikTok and other search engines to find better answers for their queries. Now, Lily Ray kind of brought this to the attention of the SEO and well, you can see that all of the SEOs have a very strong opinion of this. You know, if it's not a search engine that you use, like if you're not familiar with TikTok, I could see why that would be off-putting or scary, but some of these visual search engines uh, or just you know, opinion search engines like Reddit have a lot more value than what you'll find just on Google. I actually put out on Twitter, you know, the fact that we shouldn't ridicule all these other search, like search engines, you know, whether it's social media or, you know, visual search engines, because they have a ton of value. They serve a different purpose and sometimes they surface better results than Google does, at least at this point. What do you think? Is there a search engine that I missed from this list? Martin McDonald on Twitter asked the SEOs, what are the top three SEO tools that you use? And just like whenever this question comes up, there's a whole bunch of different answers. A lot of the uh, kind of well-known players in the field came up, whether it's like SEMrush or Ahrefs or Screaming Frog or uh, also asked or even just Search Console. I have to say the, the the actual Twitter accounts of the search tools or the founders of the search tools are thirsty. Look at them all up in this thread. They were all up in this thread being like, see me? I mean, you have to be self-promotional, but oof, oof. I, I see you search tools and search tool founders, yes. And then Niche Site Lady had a really interesting Twitter thread all about how she does kind of manual SERP research, how sometimes you have to get dirty. If you want to rank for a certain query, you got to look at it in Google. And so what does she do and recommend? Do the titles of the search results match the keyword? Do you actually see them there? If not, that's an opportunity. The DR of each site on page one. It, do they have DRs or is there an opportunity? Now remember, DR is a made up metric by SaaS tools. That said, um, you know, it is a good kind of indicator about where your site stands, the domain rating compared to what you're seeing on the SERPs. She says, are there forums on page one? So if you're seeing Reddit as a, or Quora as a top result, then that means there isn't great content out there and you can be that content. That's an opportunity. Are e-commerce sites on page one? Just an indication of search intent. You know, you should always be looking at search intent and seeing what people are looking for. And if that is the case, then maybe that's not the type of query you want to go after unless you have an actual like transactional page. Uh, what's the word count on the top five articles? Opportunity to expand um, the ideas there. And what's the content quality like? If it's crappy content, you can do better. Go for it. Do better. 
great examples from her, great list of tactics, and how it's really important to actually manually look at the search engine result page sometime and see what the results are for search engines, for search intent, to actually determine whether you should go for it. Okay, there are a ton of SEO events going. People are out and about, and the SEO in-person events are in full force. Last week, there was this SEO kitchen show, which was actually digital by OnCrawl, but really cool concept. Basically, they took a variety of topics, had three to four people who had expertise in those topics, and then discussed it. I just liked the idea. They did uh, a gaming-focused webinar or virtual event uh, last year. This is the kitchen show. Very clever, bite-sized morsel of SEO content. Good job, OnCrawl. And a lot of really uh, smart people participated in this, and I liked how diverse it was. Um, SEMrush did SEO day. Uh, they did this in collaboration with Punto Rojo. So the cool thing with this is they actually did it in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So, you know, you weren't necessarily left out if you didn't speak English. SEMrush is really great internationally, but it was a full day of content and discussions and presentations all around SEO. And then uh, in Philly, Search Love. So this was put on by Distilled. They do one in San Diego. They do one in Philly. Uh, they do another one, I believe, in London but really great kind of, uh, you know, event where a bunch of different people came together, gave presentations. Our own Mike King was there, our own John Merch. He didn't give a presentation, but he was hanging out with the likes of like Noah Lerner and Claire Carlisle. Seemed like a really cool event. Uh, for all of these, I don't know if there'll be replays. You might have the opportunity to get those. They may might be paid, but... Either way, SEO events are full full season. MozCon is coming up uh, next month. And so, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to join one of these events, check it out. There's always great content and the networking. You get a sense of the community, the industry, and hanging out with people. And, and most of them are really nice, really nice to get to know. So, Plurty did a survey where they reached out to 100 people in SEO and asked them a series of questions. Some always great insights. And actually, there were a whole bunch of, uh, like, SEO people that they reach out to that I wasn't familiar with. They're based in the Ukraine, so there are a lot of like Eastern European, but just it's always great to see people who aren't just kind of in your SEO bubble. So kudos to all of them. But some of the interesting questions that were surfaced, there are 29 questions, some that I thought were interesting slash, slash funny. Uh, one was, uh, will the average budget for SEO increase in 2022? 42% uh, expected a 20% increase. Interestingly enough, nobody expected a decrease. I wonder if that's because that wasn't an option or nobody is decreasing their SEO budget. They found that, what do you think about using AI content for a website? 36% thought it was a great idea. 36% thought it was completely risky and that you know Google might penalize you. And 20% really didn't know. But it was interesting to see how like almost 50-50 or 33, 33, 33 people were uh, when it comes to using AI content for SEO and generating organic traffic. And then I just had to include this because I think it's so funny, but is the use of LSI keywords important in 2022? The scary thing to me is that 59% uh, think they're important and they're not a thing and people still believe in LSI keywords. 59 of the 100 people thought they're important. Okay, okay. You know, I don't. I don't think it's a thing, but you know, you do you. There was another thought piece on is Google search dying? Uh, this was by Charlie Warzel of The Atlantic and it kind of summarizes. So Marie Haynes was interviewed. Uh, Ram Fishkin was pulled into it. Uh, it kind of summarizes a lot of the ideas from Dimitri uh, Baraton's post on Google is dying that went viral back in February on Hacker News. Uh, you know, identifying the fact that, you know, Google as a search engine is trying more and more to monetize, which is like bastardizing the results. You're seeing more and more ads, less and less organic. One thing that was interesting is, uh, you know, Charlie saw from uh, Dasuke Wakabayashi, the, like the way he was looking at a SERP result and how everything was like e-commerce or an ad and not organic there. You can see through, through his example, it is problematic. 
these themes kind of come up. They've been coming up for like the 10 past years. And, you know, Charlie identifies that. He, you know, talks to Marie and says, why do you think that is? And Marie says that she thinks we're kind of in this transitional phase where Google is, you know, getting better with mom and trying to predict what you're trying to search. But there's this kind of like poor results situation happening. And because, you know, Google isn't good enough yet. And so, you know, like I mentioned earlier, people are going to other different search engines. Um, and Ram Fishkin, as I pointed out last week, and he mentioned in this article, is that Google continues to kind of prioritize their own products, whether it's like YouTube or Google Maps or Flights or all that. And while they're decent answers, uh, the lack of innovation is preventing search from being better, ultimately. Tom Critchlow, uh, SEO MBA, put out another great article. Uh, all of these are very much in service to his courses, but it's so on point. He talks about this idea around the SEO skills maturity matrix, and he identifies why, what is the ceiling for in-house and agency when it comes to the skill sets that you need to move up as an SEO. And he divides it by the idea of these hard skills versus soft skills. Hard skills being like more tactical, more tactical and technical, and soft skills being more communicative and being able to project manage and relations between whether it's like clients or in-house. I love how he breaks down like the kind of tiers of these skill sets based on different components, whether it's the technical, whether it's the communication skill set, and how it's different from agency and in-house. Now he did identify that the ceiling for an agency salary is not as high as the ceiling for an in-house salary, but they're different types of jobs. With the agency, it's really all about that client relationship client management with in-house it's really navigating the politics and getting buy-in from the c-suite completely different even though they're both related to you know communications and internal and politics internal politics politics um they're very different the agency responsibilities versus in-house i like the way he breaks it down he has a template that you can use to identify where you stand on your own skill set um, and what you're capable of but great article by tom that's uh you know worth diving into there our own andrew mcdermott on ipol rank was looking at the seo pricing in 2022 like pricing seo services and so he looks at you know why seo might cost what it costs all the different variables you need to consider when you're like hiring a consultant or an agency he tapped into some of the research done by hrefs and credo for instance but identifying like the complexity and scope of the job the location you know what you're trying to accomplish whether it's you know information architecture versus content versus backlinks versus technical seo and how all of these different factors will influence the price, but he looks at what you can expect, how you can identify the ROI, and he goes in deep there. Really awesome in-depth article by Andrew that I recommend that you check out. So Gianluca Fiorelli put together this really great article. It, the title cracks me up. It's Oh My Mom or How to Think uh, SEO in the Era of Algorithm Based on AI. He goes through this whole process talking about the idea of the messy middle. So when you're looking at your queries and you're trying to rank for a variety of different queries, he was saying that, you know, historically Google for a long time has been talking about micro moments, you know, the search intent that we all talk about, like, I want to know, I want to learn about things. I want to do, I want to buy. And then he talks about that in terms of the buyer's journey where, you know, sometimes you might be, you know, discovering things and then evaluating things and ultimately making the purchase. And where do these micro moments sit within that sort of messy middle journey? Because it's really hard. It's not a linear search from here's what I want. I'm going to go buy that thing. No, there's a lot of kind of education and evaluation that happens in between. And so he talks about it in the context of, for instance, the Star Wars uh, minifigures and how Google with specifically Google mom and the contextual search options that come up from the knowledge graph 
for a given query are actually guiding users more and more down a zero click journey. So for instance, you look at the, the mini legion theory, the mini legion figures, and you see these contextual menus where maybe it's stores or news or reviews, and you click on one of those and it Google actually refines the query. It changes the query and provides different results. And that is considered a zero click result. They're not actually going outside of Google, they're staying on, but they're refining their query to discover more information, to understand, go from that I wanna know to I wanna buy all within Google. And so he takes that concept and he takes it further with Google Lens and how you add the visual element when you're searching for something with an image and how we need to optimize our pictures now for Google to surface that as part of this on Google buyer's journey. And ultimately, the idea of optimizing for entity first search. So if you are, you know, looking for these mini, le mini uh, legion figures of Star Wars, there's a whole journey, a whole set of entities that you can optimize content for. So you'll appear across the entire messy middle journey of all these contextual searches using a tool like also asked, like people also ask, figuring out what people are gonna search for next and having the content there. So you appear at every different space, considering that you might, you know, your user might not ever leave Google until they actually go to buy the product. So the way you think about building out your content around the query and around this journey as um, users can poten potentially like broaden their search or refine their search, you want to th think about the entire set of entities that are connected so you can be there every step of the way. His visuals are great. The way he breaks it down makes a lot of sense. I think this is a new strategy that people are gonna really start paying more and more attention to if they're not doing it already. Awesome article by John Luca. So Patrick Stocks of Ahrefs put together a nice little study all around how he is looking at Google Search Console and identified that almost 50% of the results were not attributed, the clicks were not attributed to a specific keyword. He basically pulled from the main Google Search Console reports and then used the API to pull out all of the other data and notice there weren't one-to-one -one sort of connections. Now, this seems um, relevant to Roger Monty's article that he wrote last week in Search Engine Journal, talking about the discrepancies between Google Analytics and Google Search Console. In that, he explained, and Patrick does as well, reasons why Google actually doesn't surface all of the keywords. Um, one of the aspects of it is in terms of like long tail keywords. If you have just a few keyword searches for very specific topics that might actually be, in, be able to identify you as a user, bad example, but say you're like looking for, you know, a, a credit card number or an address or something that would be personally identifiable if it showed up in keywords, that's not gonna show up in Google Search Console. Now that's a bad example because there's, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of, of these long tail keywords that aren't gonna get surfaced because they're so small, they have no volume that you know Google has a limited amount of resources that they're gonna use for Google Search Console. Patrick's point is that even though it's not surfaced in Google Search Console, it's Google Search Console, there's a load of clicks that come from these various key keywords and you just need to be aware that when you're building out your content, it can range not just for your head terms or for keyword search volume, it can go for all of those like, you know, searched once, searched twice types of keywords. The cool thing about Patrick's article is he also provides a Google Data Studio report that you can copy to do this research on your own to look at your own Google Search Console clicks and what's missing and what's not and identify the discrepancies there on your own. Cool article by Patrick. So every year, AJ Cohn, who writes a blog on a blind five-year-old, really awesome articles. He doesn't post all the time, but when he does, his thought leadership is so smart, the way he thinks about SEO. And so he does a review every year about how his past year went. Now, obviously we're in June, and he just published his 2021 review. The thing that's interesting is it 
it's so vulnerable and it's so honest and he shares his highs and his lows from 2021 but he identified for his own personal experience some trends that he thought were worth pointing out and I think are really interesting as well. You should read the entire article, but he talks about the value of pattern recognition when it comes to searching and queries and things that are ultimately going to surface a ton of clicks, being able to notice trends and notice those patterns that he does for his clients has been you know, super valuable for him. Uh, additionally, he talks about people continuing to over-index on keyword volume tools. So just because Google says there are 20,000 uh, monthly searches for this specific keyword or zero searches for this specific keyword, a lot of times that's incorrect. And it's true for any software tool. He said for his clients, for instance, this 20,000 keyword actually you know, ends up driving 30,000 clicks per month. Or recently on Twitter, uh, Abby Reamer shared her example of how many clicks she's getting from zero search volume uh, keywords as well. So you can't trust these tools and he highlights that. Also, he's seen more and more volatility in SERPs that there's no always up into the right sort of pattern with SEO, more as he describes it, crocodile teeth, like one week great, next week not. One week great, not next week not. And you can start to see, you know, like directional cues that are going in the right direction, but it's not just always an up and down, like anything in life, you know? Two steps forward, one step back. And finally, he is of the mindset of throughput that almost done is better than perfect. That if you're just adding, as he puts it, you know, three uh, jigsaw puzzle pieces to a 2000 piece jigsaw, you're not going to see a lot of um, improvement. And so while I don't think this is a um, him advocating for like AI content where it's like, you know, total programmatic SEO and just generating a ton of content, Quantity of content matters. You do need to continue to improve and put things out there more than just like trying to get that one thing perfect. Interesting article from AJ. I appreciate him being vulnerable. Check out that article when you have a chance. In technical SEO, Amanda Jordan uh, wrote this awesome kind of case study for Moz, talking all about how they increased revenue by doing uh, you know website optimization, speed optimization for a franchise. She broke down her process and methodology, which is like you know staging it on WordPress engine, uh, optimizing the images, making sure that nothing's broken. Um, you know, installing WP Rocket, reviewing all the WordPress plugins and removing anything that wasn't being used, going through that whole process, and then, you know, basically launching the site with all the improvements. And they found that there was a 32% increase in new users, 47% increase in phone calls, which is a important business metric for local SEO, 63% increase in phone, uh, free quote requests in a year over year comparison to 21 to 2020, 55% increase in revenue uh, of 2019 uh, year over year, and then 60% uh, increase in revenue in comparison to 2020. It is so important, obviously, to be able to show the results of something like this, where you increase the speed of a website, then everything else improves. The faster website, the more leads. So great job by Amanda in that article to really prove the value of Core Web Vitals and, and improving that and what you should do for your own site. So Morty Oberstein of Wix put out this epic resource guide on everything SEO when it comes to Wix. This is like the man should be a product marketer. He basically goes through everything you need to know about technical SEO and how you can use it specifically with Wix. Need to redirect? Got it. Need to worry about your robot.txt file on Wix? This is how you do it. Morty's got it all covered. Check out the epic guide. So good if you're a Wix user. Awesome work there. LeeFoot has done an incredible job continuing to improve his BERT interlinking tool. So on the Streamlit app, basically uses BERT to identify these interlinking opportunities. You upload your Screaming Frog um, crawl file, you select the H1 from the dropdown, download the Excel file and put it into this tool and it gives you all of these opportunities. So for instance, you like fil filter the input output, 
Um, you can adjust, adjust the cluster size, you can adjust the accuracy, and ultimately it allows you to find links that are semantically related to content. This feels uh, similar to you know what Andy Volpini was doing with WordLift, but it's not like necessarily just for e-commerce pages, this is for any type of site. Really great tool that Lee has put together. Check that out. And then a couple other tool releases. So Cindy Crum and her team at Mobile Moxie has put out a couple weeks ago, they did the Pagescope. This one is the Serperator, which I think is a really cool tool that allows you to look at rankings on a given SERP and then identify, she has two scores, which are really interesting to me, the Moxie score and the MESS score. The Moxie score is all about, you know, different places where you show up even if it's not necessarily like your domain. So if you show up in social media for a SERP, if you show up in you know a top 10 list and being able to say, okay, well, if I show up in six of the 10 results on page one, even if it's not my domain, that's really valuable as an SEO. They have this proprietary Moxie score to show that. So I, I love that. And then the MESS score talks more about pixels, like not all queries are are created equal. So if you have a bunch of ads and a featured snippet and people also ask and then an organic link, that link is not going to drive as much traffic as, you know, the type of query that doesn't have any sort of features and you're an organic link like based on pixel size. So they've created this mess score to identify the mess um, on a specific query, and that's another way to show your value as an SEO. Really cool uh, Chrome extension that you can access. It's in you know the Chrome store there. And the other cool thing, and I'm sure I'm missing a ton of the Serperator's value because it's it does a lot. Uh, it also lets you look at geolocation. So looking basically mobile, desktop, uh, different versions. Uh, and then looking at the geolocation, looking at the differences there, similar to the Pagescope. That's so cool. Meanwhile, Advanced Web Ranking put out a similar Chrome extension, specifically when it comes to geolocation. So if you wanna look at the results for a page from any location, you can use their Chrome extension as well. That's free, so you can just you know put it in there, look at the location, and boom, see the different results. Another useful tool if you're working with multi-location uh, clients or if your own business is all over the place. And finally, Rankable is back. We're coming back. We will be back on July 6th with our first episode, Chima Meje. I'm super excited. A slightly new format. Lots of great guests. We actually have a sizzle reel. You know what? Let's let's watch the sizzle reel of what you can expect um, coming up in this next season. Use keywords everywhere or keyword insight. You are, you're an image SEO nerd. Like you're obsessed yeah. with the SEO of images. Yeah. Like There's a lot of really crap products coming up on the first positions of Google Shopping. The internet is not, uh, is, is, is not just a sort of a passive thing. It's not, it's not something that we just digest. It's something that we interact with in real time, right? If you fill a hole in a language that your content isn't written in, but no one else is writing about it, Google's like, we're just gonna show your stuff, man. Evergreen SEO is so important during those times because we know that breaking news is going to spike. What is up, hype? Rankable is back. Super pumped. Super pumped for these episodes with Cindy Crum and Crystal Carter and Shelby Blackley and Jesse Wilms and Miriam Jessier and obviously uh, Chima. So many more coming. Super excited for it. Keep your eyes peeled for Rankable. It's going to be awesome. That's it. Long episode today because there's so much going on in the world of SEO. It's so fascinating. I love, you know, what everyone's doing. I love these articles. If you're into this, if you enjoy this, please subscribe to the channel, share on social. I really appreciate it. My name is Garrett Sussman of iPullRank. This has been the SEO Weekly, and I will catch you next week.